Matthew chapter 18. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll be kicking off our fall series on the Ten Commandments, or as I like to call it, Ten Reasons Why We Need Jesus. That's not original with me, but that's what um, a lot of the Ten Commandments are going to be doing, really pointing us to Jesus Christ, and we'll dig in um, how we can love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as ourself. But today, as we celebrate, and, and make no mistake, this, this is a celebration. This is the fact that we are here. And we've been here a year, is the, the good work of God Almighty. And so I wanted us to celebrate the good news today, specifically in Jesus' offer of rest. So in Matthew 11, we'll read, um, we'll read uh, verses uh, 20 through 20 through 30. I'm sorry, we'll read verses 25 through 30, and then I'll pray and we'll get after it. Hear now God's word. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, today, even in these next few moments, as we examine the good news, might it sink into our hearts. Uh, as we've heard read before, might the words of our, my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Might today be another day where we continue to turn from those vain idols that would promise us rest and turn to your Son, Jesus Christ, who promises us and gives us and earns for us rest, we pray in his name. Amen. Eric Little, uh, the Olympic runner, grew up in China. I was not aware of that, Uh, but he grew up in China as a son of British missionaries. He ran in the 1924 Olympics in Paris, almost 100 years ago, doing some 100-meter and 400-meter races, and his story is immortalized in the 1981 film Chariots of Fire. Eric, having grown up in China, was headed back to China, and um, you know that Part of his story is the fact that he did not run the 100-meter finals because it was on Sunday. And so one of his teammates uh, asked him to do the 400-meter the in his stead so that he could race and win another medal. And at one point during his training, he was scolded by his sister as though she thought he was giving too much attention to his running preparation instead of giving attention to his future work in China. It was in response to this that he uttered his famous line, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. That's where Mr. Little and I part ways. (laughs) Um, I feel other things when I run, but they are definitely not pleasure. <laughs> and for a man who, who was the best at the world at running 100 and 400 meters, he found pleasure in rest in an act of exertion. How does one gain rest in the middle of toil? Have you thought about that? See, the gospel is the good news that invites us to rest. And I want us to see the good news this morning because the good news, it's good news because of Jesus' revelation, it's good news because of Jesus' relationship, and it's good news because of Jesus' rest. Jesus' revelation, Jesus' relationship, and Jesus' rest here in these five verses. First of all, it's good news because of Jesus' revelation. Truth comes from the Father. Look in verse 25. Jesus declared. He speaks out. 
with great clarity and forthrightness. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. There's a lot packed into these two verses. First of all, Jesus declares that Father is Lord of all. This, this phrase, Lord of heaven and earth, is a, is a literary device known as a marisma, where we take the first part and the last part, and we mean everything in between. Jesus will do this in the book of Revelation and say, I'm the Alpha Omega. And for those of you who have studied Greek, you know that Alpha is the first letter, Omega is the last letter, and he means I'm not just the first and last, I'm everything. I'm not just A and B and C, I'm A to Z. And the Father is saying, Jesus is saying about the Father, that he is Lord, not just of heaven, not just of earth, but of the whole created cosmos and the whole created universe. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, explicitly states this. And frankly, at this day and age, in the age of emperors, this would have been treasonous. This would have been treasonous. Why? If the wrong people caught you saying this, they could have had you drawn up on charges. Because in this day and age, the prevailing sentiment was, I am Caesar, and I am Lord of all. That there are no other gods, I am the best among gods. I am Lord of all. So for Jesus to say, no, the Father, the one who created all things, is the Lord of all things, would have been quite treasonous. But if it's not the Father, who is it? See, we live in, in not an unlike time as that time. Everyone is saying, no, this is the God. No, this is God. And they might not use that term, but they act like it nonetheless, that my view of the world is God. Amen. My money is God. My riches are God. My connections are God. My, my relationships are God. My family is God. See, we're hardwired this way to worship something. We're hardwired to give ourselves over to someone greater than ourselves. In fact, but sin has corrupted that. In fact, sin has so corrupted that that we think that we are the end in ourselves. But Jesus says, no, the Father is Lord of all. But notice what he does. Jesus goes to this high spot, this great transcendent argument that says, God the Father is Lord of heaven and earth. But what's he done? In verse 25, he has hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. He's, he's, he's taken them from those who would be wise, those who would be clever, and revealed them to the little children. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sure that by the time we've all spent enough time on the planet, we've run into a know-it-all. And this man shared the story of his friend who's a guitar teacher. She's a good guitar teacher. She's been teaching for 20 years. So she goes in the guitar, sh this, pardon me, the guitar store to sample a few items. And um, the sales guy's a little full of himself. And the sales guy told her that if she wanted an electric guitar, she needed an amplifier because they work different. She's like, oh, really? Why don't, why don't you show me? So he goes over to the electric guitar, plugs one in, plays a few notes. She says, can, can I see that? Can I try? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. Try it out for yourself. You know, think he's going to land the sale. And she goes on this five-minute face shredding solo and just totally shows him up. And she doesn't buy the guitar. She goes somewhere else and buys it. You know, we don't like know-it-alls. Why? Because they think they know it all. And we understand that as limited finite creatures, we don't know everything, even though sometimes we act like we do. As a, as a measure of posturing, we think we do. We, we like people to think we know everything, but we don't. And Jesus here is coming, coming off verses 20 through 24, where he excoriates these cities. Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida, this is, this is home base for him. And he says, if the works were done in, in, in Tyre and Sidon, that were done in you. If the works were done in these notoriously pagan, wicked port cities that were done in you, they would have repented. But you didn't. And so it will be more tolerable for them. Jesus starts on the inside and works his way out. He said, you think you know it all. 
You see, the, the wise and the understanding in this context are the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the day. And they were well motivated. They were well committed to the word, to the law of God. But they kept putting more and more burdens on it, more and more fences, as it were, to protect you from, from breaking it. And these, all these extras had become burdensome on the people. You notice this term at the end of verse 25, little children. We are mostly a children-centric society in many ways, not in this case. In this particular day and age in which Jesus first spoke, children had nothing. They were nothing. They could be tossed out at a, at a whim. They had no standing. No rights. So what's Jesus actually saying here about the Father? Jesus is saying that God has hidden himself from the clever and the self-sufficient. From those who said, I don't need him. I've got my own righteousness. And Jesus has said, no, the Father has revealed himself to those who know they need everything. Who are dependent on everything. We're going to have some, some new babies here pretty soon in our congregation. Thank you, Lord. They're going to be dependent on their parents for everything. They're not going to know how to walk, how to move, how to change themselves, how to eat. They are dependent. And Jesus is saying, you want the Father to reveal himself to you? And become like a little child. Humble yourself. Realize that your cleverness gets you nowhere. Your self-righteousness gets you nowhere. And so we need to stop and ask, what is our self-righteousness? It's easy for us. See, because we're, we're always trying to add to our record. It's easy to say, oh, my kids are well-behaved. I'm glad my kids aren't like those kids. It's easy to say, oh, you watch the news, you, you see someone's mugshot, you say, oh, I'm, I'm glad I'm well-behaved. I'm not like that guy. I'm an I'm a upstanding member of society. I'm not like those people. God must like me. I read my Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. God must like me. I attend church. I do good things. No, God likes you, but not because of that. You see, there's nothing more stenchous, nothing more stinking than self-righteousness. We can sniff it a mile away, can't we? We can see it in other people, but we're blind to our own. It's easy for us to say, I'm put together, I've got my act together, I've got a little money in the bank, the 401k is growing, nice family, a house, picket fence, I'm doing great, right? And it's easiest for a hold on to those. You want to know what you're self-righteous about? What do you get angry about when it doesn't work out? What do you get upset about when you don't get it? Chances are, that's what you're using to put God in your deck. But God's not a vending machine, is he? God doesn't take those kind of ducats. That's not the currency he deals in. Self-righteousness has no worth in the kingdom of God. The Father is Lord of all. The Father has revealed himself to the lowly, and the Father is gracious. Look at the end of verse 26. This was Father's gracious will, to reveal it to those who have nothing. It was gracious. Do you see this? Benevolent. It's kind. It's not something God has to do, but it's something that he loves to do. The Protestant reformer John Calvin said, failure makes us fit to receive his grace. The only way we receive graces is from the Father is through Christ. And some might say, if you think Christ is exclusive, that's not gracious. And I would say that claim in itself is a form of exclusion. We will try to find grace somewhere, mostly through our own efforts, but the only place that grace is found is through Jesus Christ alone, as revealed by the heart of the Father. God's revelation to us in Jesus Christ is immensely gracious. He could have left us like Adam and Eve and left us in the dark. But he said, no, I will reveal my heart to you, not just through some letter, but through a person. And a person who will come and tabernacle with you, Jesus Christ. This invitation is good news because of Jesus' revelation. 
It is also good news because of Jesus' relationship. Look at verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. You know, this was another big deal here. Relationships are a big deal to us, aren't they? We love growing up. We love having a best friend. Like being around elementary kids, I hear the question, who's your best friend? Who's your best friend? Who's your best friend? Relationships are important to us. In fact, they're so important to us that we commit ourselves to one another in the highest human relationship of marriage. Relationships are important because, one, we want to be loved, and two, we want to be known. Right? We want someone to love us for who we really are. We don't want to have to put up pretense or a facade or a mask. But at the same time, we're, li- we're a little inhibited, right? Like We're afraid that if someone really knows us, that if someone really knows what's going on, if someone knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, are they really going to love us? And Jesus here says, no, I have this unique relationship with my Father. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows him except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone reveals. And this would echo certain portions of Scripture. Matthew 2, out of Egypt I have called my Son, the prophecy says. In Matthew 3, at his baptism, this is my beloved Son. Hear him. This would echo Exodus 33, when Moses climbed the mountain and spoke to God face to face. But someone greater than Moses is here. His name is Jesus. And this is spoken again to by by Jeremiah, by Hosea, by John, by Paul, and they would all acknowledge that this knowledge is a gift. And this saying by Jesus Christ would have enraged Jewish hearers. It would have enraged them. Who do you think you are, Jesus, to have this kind of access with a father? Who do you think you are? And at first glance, this might not be a big deal, but this is why they tried to kill him. Who has the unmitigated gall to make himself this close with a father? Only someone who is this close from other. This is an outrageous claim among other world religions. No other world religions would claim to be one with a father. None of them. But another reformer, Martin Luther, would say, hold on to this man, Jesus. He's the only God we've got. Hold on to this man, Jesus. He's the only God we've got. See, this passage is good news because of the revelation that we have the information we need. This is good news because of Jesus' relationship with the Father. We can't get to the Father, but someone else can get there for us. And it's good news because of Jesus' invitation to rest. Um, I have three kids, as most of you know, and so um, lots of Disney stuff goes on in our house. Just the way it is, I've made peace with it. Um, it's okay. And one of the newer movies that has gotten lots of play, one of the more recent, I mean, more recent than the original, you know, Cinderella, Snow White, etc. One of the newer ones is Encanto. Uh, we played Encanto a lot in our house, a lot. And there's a song. Uh, well, one of the characters' name is Louisa. She's one of the sisters, and she's she's strong. She's physically strong, extremely strong. When you see how strong she is, you wonder, how did you get that strong? What's going on here? And she sings a, her, her famous ballad, her song, Surface Pressure. And some of, the, some of the lyrics go like this, I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. I've moved mountains. I've moved churches. And I glow because I know what my worth is. But wait. If I could shake the crushing weight of expectations, would that free some room up for joy or relaxation or simple pleasure? Instead, we measure this growing pressure. Keeps growing, keeps going, because all we know is pressure like a drip, drip, drip that'll never stop. Pressure that'll tip, tip, tip till you just go pop. And aside from being a catchy song, a catchy tune that's easy to to get in your ear. 
I think what the, the song intelligently puts forth the struggle of our own hearts. That we want to be strong. We want to be tough. We want to be seen as competent, intelligent, well-versed in today's society. But wait, if I could shake the crushing weight of those expectations, we find ourselves bound to the expectations of others. If we could just live up to those, maybe they'll like us. If I could live up to my own expectations, then maybe I would like me. Do you feel like that? If I could just parent better, if I could just finance better, if I could just have abs better, if I could just network better, if I could just climb the ladder better, if I could just do all the things, then I'll be happy. But we know that's not the case because everything that we use for currency is righteousness. It is a crushing weight of expectation. And Jesus here comes and says, Come, come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Those who labor and are heavy laden in this context specifically are those who are bound by the extra-biblical laws of the Pharisees. And maybe in this context we're not that far off. Maybe we've constructed some of our own laws. And we said, if I could just do, if I could follow this law and this, this little help alongside it, you know, maybe I'll get a few extra bounty points. Maybe. But many of us labor over the curated images of social media. The comparison of those around us in our workplace, in our third places, in our places of recreation. But Jesus says, no. Come to me. This is an invitation to personal communion. That Jesus knows everything about us, but he invites all of us to him. He says, take my yoke. This is an invitation to personal mission. You know what a yoke is? I'm not a farmer. But a yoke is, is what you take. You took, you took two oxen and you put them in that yoke. And they could, their combined strength was, was more than the sum of their parts. It's synergistic. One plus one equaled more than two. And you could plow your field and plant your crops and eat your food. And you didn't have to get out there and work the horses. The the oxen did that for you. At the end, there was a harvest. There's there's something to do. Jesus says, my yoke's different than the other folks that are wanting you to yoke up with them. Jesus says, come to me. This is an invitation to personal communion. Take my yoke. This is an invitation to personal mission. Learn of me. Uh, This is essentially saying, copy me. Follow everything I do. This is an invitation of personal transformation. Why, Jesus? Why should I commune with you? Why should I join you on your mission? Why should I be transformed by you? Because he says, I will give you rest. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. He says, this yoke is a learning experience. This yoke is a moving experience. You're not still. This yoke is a mission experience. There's something to do. This yoke is a freeing experience. You're in a group project with Jesus. And guess who's doing all the work? Not you. Not you. Jesus is doing all the work. And why can Jesus say, I'm gentle and lowly in heart? Through his whole ministry, we see that. Of all the people... Of all the people who could have bragged, Jesus was perfect in every way. Isn't that what the writer of the Hebrews says? That he was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin. That Jesus never once disobeyed. He never once slipped up. Jesus had all the power to work these miracles. And did he flaunt it? Did he hold it over you? Did he badger you with it? No, he says, come. Why don't you take credit for it? Why don't you take credit for it? I'll do all this work and you'll get all the credit. Isn't that what the gospel states? Isn't that the good news? That all of our wrongdoings, all of our sins, all of our rebellion, all of our putting our fists in the face of God, that goes on Jesus. At the cross, his blood fully covered that. And what do we get in exchange? We get Jesus' record keeping. We get Jesus' righteousness. 
We get Jesus who will say, come, unite with me and get credit for everything. I died. Guess what? You died too. I rose again. You rose again too. I'm building a new heavens and new earth for you and you'll come enjoy it and you won't have to do a thing for it. I've done it all. How scandalous. You say, that's not fair. And I quote this all the time. Yes, that's the beauty of grace. It makes life not fair. It's totally unfair. That's only how, that's the only way grace works. You can't earn grace. You can't earn grace. None of our collective works will gain us of an ounce of rest. But someone else's works will. Jesus Christ. You know, the psalmist asks, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, whose tongue's not given to deceit. And you do a self-inventory, and like, well, that's not me. You do an inventory of your friends and family, Not minimize God's holiness, He has taken care of it for us. And now He has revealed the heart of the Father for us. You know what the heart of the Father is? Come enjoy me. Come enjoy my creation. Come enjoy the new heavens and the new earth. There's an English revivalist named um, John Berridge. John Berridge was, was a preacher. Uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, I believe, he wrote this little, little line. Run, John, run, run, the law demands. That gives me neither feet nor hands. But sweeter news the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. Come take up the wings of Jesus today. Heavenly Father, we ask that today that you would that you would wreck our self righteousness. You would completely wreck it. And Father, you would you would pry it out of our hands like like an old dirty frog from a kid's fingers. Lord, that we would see right through our idols. We would see right through the lie the world is telling us. Saying, just come over here in the marketplace. Come over here, walk a little harder. Come over here, be a little more beautiful. Come over here, just, just walk a little bit more. Let us hear the clarion call of Jesus Christ to yoke up with him. To get credit for the group project that we didn't do. To enjoy his rest. Might North Augusta Fellowship be known as a place where we find rest in Jesus' good news, where we live out of that rest, out of that good news, and where we spread that good news like an ambassador. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name.